Last month I did a talk that was a great myth, a story um, from India on the uh, the story of Nachiketa um, and the, the Lord of Death. And I feel like I wanted to do some stories in these talks in these months. So tonight we have a, a different story. And again, I ask um, indulgence of those who've heard some of these stories before. Uh, think of them as bedtime stories. Oh, can I hear that one again? So the theme tonight that I'd like to talk about, which is so central to the practice of awakening or the liberation of the heart, is respect. Now I suppose we should turn on Aretha right now, you know, (laughs) thank you. That would be the way to start properly and to honor her and her gift to us. Um, The Buddhist texts... A number of them begin with this phrase, O nobly born, O you who are the sons and daughters of the awakened ones, of the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas, do not forget who you really are. Do not forget your true nature. So they begin with this beautiful expression of respect to you, that you were born with a basic goodness and a, and a heart of compassion that is born into every child. Um, And you're born with the capacity to awaken and live in a a wise and a caring way in this world. Do not forget who you really are. And then it goes deeper than that, as you will see in this talk. Who are you really, it says. Who got born into this human incarnation? What is that spirit that came into this body? So the story that I would tell now is um, an Arthurian legend or story about Sir Gawain, who was one of the great knights in the Arthurian round table. And um, um, Sir Gawain was traveling through Arthur's kingdom in the countryside when he went through a very thick and dark forest, which there used to be a great deal of in England. And in fact, as a little aside, now that I think of it, I had the privilege of teaching at Oxford University um, a couple months ago at the Oxford Mindfulness Center and so forth, and spent some time there. And um, as as my uh, guide said, would you like the full Hogwarts experience? Because we, you know, that's where Harry Potter was filmed, and there are these fantastic old Gothic you know, cathedrals and and, uh, dining halls and so forth, um, which we did go to. And anyway, it happens to connect this to the forest in Sir Gawain that, uh, oh, a couple decades ago, in one of the oldest colleges at Oxford, which was built in the 1600s, um, the great beams that held up the ceilings in the in the dining hall started to get dry rot after 400 years. And the custodians and the caretakers of Oxford became concerned, you don't get five-foot-wide beams anymore at the hardware store, those old, enormous old-growth trees. And they were worried, what will we do? Maybe we'll get laminate. And then somebody said, well, why don't you talk to the college foresters? So it turns out that Oxford has a whole private forest somewhere in England. And those who built those ancient halls said, you know, someday those those beams will get dry rot. And so 400 years ago or 450 years ago, they planted a stand of trees which were waiting for someone to say, now is the time. This is the way to run a culture, by the way, you know, to think a little bit in advance. So those are the forests that Sir Galway got lost in with these enormous trees and vines and creepers and, you know, the wilderness of England. And night fell, and he couldn't get out. There were brambles, and he was really stuck. And he tried with his great horse, and he couldn't. And as he struggled through the forest, he came upon a clearing, 
There was a bit of moonlight coming through the clouds, and there was a beautiful well. And he thought, well, at least I can rest here and quench my thirst. And he drew the bucket up from the well and drank it, quenched his thirst, and made a place to rest. And as he started to rest there, the moon came out, and then he heard the the horse, the the sounds of the hooves of a horse approaching. And he got startled in the middle of this forest. How could that be? And then he saw this great stallion approach. And on it was a woman with very long hair and a cloak. He thought, well, this is interesting. (laughs) And she arrived and she turned to him. And she had a bit of a beard and only a couple of teeth. And her skin was all wrinkled and one eye was hanging out in one direction, and she was, she was at that time, um, well, she had a number of different names. The Hag of Bera is one of the names for her. Um, Kali is her name in India. Um, Baba Yaga is her name in Russia. She is the, the woman who makes the world, who creates all things. She's, she's seen in every culture. She's the, the great old one. And she got down. She was wearing this beautiful cloak. And she said, you drank from my well. And he said, oh, I'm sorry. She said, is that all a great knight has to say? <laughs> Can't you do better than that? He said, madam, he said, if I've offended you in any way, I will do whatever I can as a knight to make up for this. She said, well, I thank you for that promise. She said, actually, there is something that you can do to make up for this. And he said, whatever you wish. She said, yes, um, I'm finding myself to be rather lonely, and so I would like to get married. (laughs) He gulped. (laughs) But he promised, and a knight makes a promise and must keep it. And she said, yes, I would like a wedding, and I would like a big wedding at Arthur's Castle, where we invite everyone. He said, couldn't we have like a little private? (laughs) She said, no, no, we have to do this right. He said, well, I need a little time to think about it. She could see his reservations, one could well understand. And he said, isn't there anything else I could do for you? (laughs) To which she replied, well, there is one thing. If you can answer a question, then, and return here, let's say in one year, with the correct answer, then I will absolve you of the, of the wish to be married. He said, certainly, what is the question? And she looked at him. And she said, what is it that women want? (laughs) He took a breath, said, all right, I'll work on it, you know. (laughs) She got back on her horse, went out through the dark of the forest, and there he was. So he got back. The next day or two, he found his way out of the forest in the light and met with Arthur, King Arthur, and the other knights, and told them what had happened, and said, I have to answer this question. He got a great big book, those old kind, you know, leather-bound, and he went with his minions around the country, interviewing women and asking them what they wanted. Some wanted wealth, some wanted many children, You know, some wanted love, um, some wanted a nice piece of land, you know, all kinds of, and he wrote them all down. And by the end of the year, he'd filled the volume, and he packed it on his steed, and he went back to the middle of that forest, and sat by the well, and the moon rose again, and sure enough, he heard the horse come, and... There descended the beautiful cloaked hag. And she said, well, have you got an answer? 
And he handed her the book. He said, I have a hundred answers. I have 500 answers. And she rep flipped through it in the moonlight and said, no, 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 no. Said, I'm sorry, you don't have the answer. Oh, when shall we have the wedding? <laughs> he said, well, can we postpone it a little? She said, how about next week? He said, how be two weeks at least? We'll get it together. So he went back. And being the night that he was, he had agreed and arranged for a wedding to take place. There was the feast the wine, the music, all the things that happen in Arthur's court for a wedding. <sighs> and then it was done. They retired to the bridal chamber. And there they are in the bridal chamber. And Sir Gawain is there with his new bride. She's seated on the side of the bed and she says, aren't you going to kiss the bride? He hesitated, as you could understand. Then she looked at him and said, You are a brave knight after all, are you not? <laughs> he took a breath and leaned over and gave her a kiss. And immediately she turned into a gl glorious and glamorous young woman who had been a princess, as in all these stories. So that was a good move on his part. Right? <laughs> And he said, oh, I'm so glad we're married now. <laughs> and she said, yes, but there is one problem. He said, she said, your kiss has released me from a spell that I have been under. And now, with this spell, I am half free. Which is to say that I can be in this beautiful form for half the time at night with you in our bedchamber, but then in the daytime, I resume the form of the hag. Or, if you wish, I can be beautiful on your arm for the day with you, and at nighttime, I turn into the hag. Which would you choose? <laughs> A little dilemma <laughs> for Sir Gawain. He spent some time meditating, He'd been to Spirit Rock, he knew. <laughs> that this was not a time to make a rash decision. And when he got quiet, and he listened deeply, and he looked at her now beautiful in front of him, and felt the love that was a bond that was growing, he looked at her and he said, I cannot choose and I will place it in your hands, what would you choose? And her eyes lit up and she said, now you have broken the whole spell. <laughs> because the answer to the question that I asked you has now been revealed from your own lips. And what it is that women want is their own sovereignty. To not have someone else say, you must do this and you must be that, and you should and you shouldn't, but to be honored in their own right for who they are. And then, I won't go into details, <laughs> but they had a wonderful wedding night and a, quite a good marriage following that.